As we begin this meeting of our Board of Education, um, I'm actually quite reflective on all that has occurred since the very last time we've been in this room together. As a matter of fact, no matter how deeply I search the adequate words to describe what our world, our country, and our cities, and our own community has experienced over the past months, it's left me empty, exhausted, heartbroken, and grieving. The convergence of a worldwide health pandemic that has claimed the lives of 22 people right here in our home county, the economic distress that has left one in four unemployed, and the reminder of injustices that still exists in our country have brought me to my knees. I am saddened and horrified by the reprehensible way in which the lives of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd ended. I grieve for them and their families. And I understand that I cannot fully fathom the impact of this, these tragic incidents on our African American community here and across the country. When the six of us became a team, we set out to unify Henry County around excellence in public education. Together, we believe in the transformative power of education and the pivotal role public education plays in the unity of our community. When we consider our step forward to getting better for one another and for our young people, we can look to the Board of Education's unified governance model that begins with shared beliefs and commitments to value, educate, protect, and support every child. We can look to our own emerging strategic plan that we developed as a community in the months leading up to March of 2020 that urges us to acknowledge and eliminate inequities and advance opportunities, access, and outcomes for every student and every student group. And we can look to our shared ambitious pursuit. Yes, Henry County Schools, we've been on an ambitious pursuit. And yes, I know everyone knows to be the highest performing district, but it has always been more importantly and today more importantly than ever that we be known for our connectivity to kids, to families, to our community, and to one another, and our belief in the capability, yes, the life-changing, history-making, world-impacting capability of every child. What strikes me is that these have been the words of our ambitious pursuit, and we've uttered them thousands of times prior to these heavy and heart-wrenching moments. These are the words of our shared pursuit. Yet, as the superintendent of Henry County Schools, I have prayed for the right words in this moment. I have searched deeply in my soul. I've wanted to be more of me and less of me all at once. What I do know is that I adore and believe in young people. I value and love our team of employees. And I care about our community with my entire being. When there is hurt, I hurt. And I resolve to do anything in my power to bring healing, hope, and courage. As a district, we've already pulled our leadership team together, all 300 principals and district leaders alike, to begin to pave the way for our own skills developing, to prepare for and foster a safe, a healthy, and an inclusive environment for students and employees when we return to our schools. In the meantime, we're developing a resource page to be available on our website to assist families in talking about the state of our nation and our cities in our community. And I am establishing a return to school task force focused on ensuring a safe, healthy, and inclusive environment for our students and employees. As a superintendent in Henry County Schools, I look to the days, weeks, and months, and even years ahead with a commitment to advance our pursuit, to renew our spirit, to continue our search for unity. This means that no matter one's race, religion, home nation, home language, gender, or age, you're valued in Henry County Schools. 
and you have access to this transformational power of an education that we all sit here united in believing is possible. Those are the words of Superintendent Mary Elizabeth Davis, sharing her heartfelt thoughts regarding the tragic circumstances that our nation, our state, and our community are facing right now. Those words speak to the unifying role public education plays in bringing us all together, especially in times like these. And with that, we welcome you to this month's Board of Education meeting recap. I'm your host, J.D. Harden, along with my co-host, Superintendent Mary Elizabeth Davis. Welcome, Superintendent Davis. Good to see you, J.D., and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. As we join you today, we uh, have a lot to share with you, of course, from our board meetings, which are always rich with, uh, you know, a board action uh, that impacts our schools, of course, and the, the community at large in so many different ways. And uh, this month, we had probably one of our longest meetings um, due to and just a lot of rich content that was shared and presented before the board, a lot of great feedback that they were able to provide on these uh, presentations um, that are setting our school system up to close out the month of June, which is you know officially the last month of our calendar year in, in, in school system terms, but also launch us into next year, which of course everybody's anticipating what that's gonna look like, and we'll get to that here in a little bit, but let's start first with uh, one of our uh, mainstays over these past uh, few months, and that's a, a, a quick recap of the great work. It's, it's hard to be quick when there's so much work, but there was a recap uh, through our continuity briefing uh, about all the work that's been going on in our district during this time of remote learning and operations. So Superintendent Davis, care to share a little bit about that? Yes, thank you, JD. And this continuity briefing concept is really designed to document the decision points, the new processes, and the new systems that have had to be designed and implemented in quite short order during the remote learning and remote operations period. And so it really is a very valuable tool to documenting this season of, you know, really infrastructure adjustments that have been necessary. And um, volume four presented to the Board of Education in June is really a documentation to wrap up how we closed out the school year. Some really significant decision points documented in, in, that, in that briefing. Um, and, and so I would invite our viewers to view the full um, briefing on our district website. You will also see the three prior volumes that have incremental, incrementally um, captured each season, each chapter of our remote learning and remote operations. And so as we close out the school year, the most uh, intriguing part of our briefing included the analysis of a survey that was distributed to many stakeholders, uh, our families, our students, our teachers, and our administrators, capture reaction, feedback, and perceptions about the experiences of remote learning. And so more than 5,000 participants contributed to that survey, and we were able to share the results of that survey in that briefing. So in addition to all of the fine documentation you've come used to expecting, there's also a moment where you can see how we are analyzing and uh, reacting to how as an organization uh, we did, what we need to do to get better, and what do we need to do to continue as a good practice that we actually learned through uh, our remote learning experience. So that was our continuity briefing, and we really, JD, shifted right into talking about summer and back to school. And so uh, if you want to talk a little bit about just some of the summer uh, and how that is taking shape, and, um, and then we can start talking about so as we come into this summer season, we also have a summer schedule set for all of our offices, including the district office and our school offices. And we, uh, we are available uh, to meet with the public by appointment only, though. And so uh, instead of just coming up there, uh, we would ask that you call or make contact via email with the, the staff member that you need to speak with. Um, because some of our offices have limited staffing right now due to the, uh, the pandemic and the precautions we're trying to take to uh, ensure everybody's health and safety. So uh, we are available, um, but we just ask that uh, you reach out and make contact with somebody ahead of that schedule. Now that rolls right into uh, some of the uh, uh, 
reopening uh, parts uh, that we could look at, some of the scenarios um, for, for athletics, as well as going back to school in August. So, uh, Superintendent Davis, I'm sure there's, uh, there's a lot of information to cover there. That's right, JD. And I think, as everyone knows, as a public school system, we're responsible to uh, some of the authorizing agencies that are giving directions on protocols and guidelines that need to be followed for really a range of decisions that need to be then made for our local community. Um, one of those agencies is uh, Georgia High School Athletic Association, GHSA. And uh, how are we uh, gradually returning to athletic programming in our high schools? So as a school system, we are gonna follow the guidelines and protocols that have been established by GHSA, and we will allow uh, summer conditioning to begin on June 15th. And so you'll begin to see not only our athletes, but our marching band um, participants, as well as our JROTC students, um, begin to uh, partake in conditioning on a voluntary basis only with a very strict protocol that will be followed for each student. Our coaches have been trained, um, as well as our instructors in fine arts and in um, JROTC. And so we'll start seeing some student activity over the summer on our high school campuses. And of course, it leads us right into talking, JD, about this back to school season. A lot of times we talk about the fall, but in Henry County Schools, the fall is August 3rd. And um, we presented uh, more detail to the board following our first introduction to our back to school plans that was shared at the May 11th board meeting. But our June board meeting started getting us a little bit more detailed. Now, as everyone, myself included as a parent, like just the craving for absolute details and logistics to be ironed out is just so, so prevalent for all of us. But we also know there has been just a dynamic set of circumstances that we are confronting. And so we are also well aware that just not every detail is ready to be articulated. Um, and so we're just gonna keep getting better and growing with more information as each summer week passes. But today, what we know is that we are planning for an on-time, on-campus start at each of our 50 schools here in Henry County on August 3rd. We are optimistic that our teachers will be able to report on the teacher um, first day back uh, the week prior to participate in pre-planning activities. And we also know that if, unless there is an executive order for school buildings to be closed, we are going to take all of the safety precautions that are manageable and in alignment with the Georgia Department of Education reopening guidelines in order to create a safe, healthy, and inclusive return for students and employees. Accompanying that, we are pleased to be able to announce that families will have a choice to opt into remote learning. If that is a preferred uh, start for your family, your student, this coming school year. Now, find out more about that. We're gonna continue weekly delivering, distributing information, but be on the lookout for early July to mid-July when you can actually formally opt into remote learning as your choice to start the school year. Now that is our primary um, scenario that we are preparing for. We are also prepared if we are given executive order to close schools in the August time period that we'll start everybody on remote learning. And we will still begin our school and our learning time together on August 3rd. Now we are studying all of the other parameters and guidelines that have been shared nationally throughout the state and locally. And we are in nearly daily contact with our district or public health officials because the expectation is that schools are preparing all of these responsible techniques and strategies right alongside public health officials. So you can count on that relationship here in Henry County being strong, and we are committed to really uh, delivering, distributing, and sharing as much information as possible as it is known as we march and creep right toward August 3rd. Uh, so this is really the start of that conversation, um, and JD, our board had a lot to talk about if we want to take a listen. So I appreciate and I'm glad that you guys have um, have two scenarios for option one, when I say two for one, uh, that you do plan on returning to school normally 
But for those that don't feel comfortable, we will have an online um, availability for those students. Um, I just, I guess, my, I guess that was a statement. Two questions is, I know we don't have a crystal ball, but, I mean, if we open school, this virus is the new flu. It's going to spread. So I just want to make sure we're planning for that, not to when it spreads at one school, like, you know, to hit kind of the panic button, lockdown, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like, but it's uh, obviously that's going to happen. We do know a lot more today than we did three months ago. Um, we also know that we can design and have a, um, a very uh, clear process for how we will respond to positive cases. And we are designing that with our District 4 Public Health Director. Our goal is that we would close schools if we were ordered by the governor to do so, and that otherwise we would seek to create as safe and healthy of an environment for as many kids as are comfortable to be there um, in, in the new school year. The CDC recommendations, I'm not asking you to go line by line, but I just want, like, personally, when you read that, those are kind of ridiculous, in my opinion. So, and I think there's a lot of community members that feel that, you know, we're going to try to abide by those, which, I mean, I told them, in my opinion, I'm only one board member, but those were clearly whoever wrote that has never been around children before. So. Well, they, they certainly feel, um, they feel uh, difficult to manage without new revenue uh, being dedicated to K-12 institutions. Um, simultaneously, I, I just think, honestly, in Henry County Schools, when we transitioned to remote learning, it was not perfect for every child, and it was not perfect for every teacher. And there were some children who were not able to do their best work, and we know that, and we want to be able to do better for every single child as they access their learning. But we were able to continue learning. We actually continued in the curriculum. We did not rely only on reviewing what had already been done. And I say that because what our employees and our kids and our families missed was learning together. There is more that happens within the four walls of a school campus than the distribution of academics only. And so I do think that when we look at the CDC guidelines, we're conscious of, of what of those guidelines would, that is required. We actually just... Re that would mean we go to remote learning, that there, there are some things in the CDC guidelines that wouldn't be practical to do with five-year-olds or three-year-olds that we believe uh, loving on, on our children and uh, a hug from a kindergarten teacher is a, is a part of the learning environment. So uh, we're just evaluating at what threshold would require us to transition to remote learning more fully. And we're also uh, more closely responsible for the guidelines that were issued by the, the Georgia Department of Education. We are really planning on a more manageable scenario until, unless there is new revenue or executive orders otherwise. There we go. I know as a algebra teacher, nobody likes math and nobody wants to do ninth grade algebra, but believe it or not, I get emails every day. Ms. Nutt, when are we coming back to school are we going to be able to see each other? Am I going to be able to see my friends? So the kids have taken a lot of this. Um, maybe they didn't come to class as they were supposed to. I have the collab classes. And it's harder for them if they don't have a teacher in front of them to keep them motivated and keep them focused, most of all. And of all people, they have me to keep them focused. But the, the point is... You're right. If we can have something for everyone, I know as a teacher, I miss my kids, and I miss all of them, even the ones that you would pray that wouldn't come today. You know, those are the faces you miss, and you miss hearing about their weekends. And like you, I believe that's just as much a part of learning their interaction and developing behavioral skills and communication skills. That's, that's what... I believe like, education is a lot. Um, I want the people to know that we are very um, tuned in tune to their children and what their children need, and we also want them to be safe. So if opening August the 3rd 
is, is great for some and not for others, then I'm, I can see us making way. I can see us making it fit for everyone because y'all have done an amazing job. I appreciate all that information. And my two questions will come from conversations that I've had with teachers recently. And the first question that I was asked is, um, are teachers going to be required to teach with a mask on? That was one question. And the other question was, um, is there a timeline that our teachers will uh, be made aware of, like what their role um, might be in this back to school plan? So those are my two questions. We aren't anticipating asking families to make a commitment to remote learning until mid-July. So I think as an organization, we can expect to rely on our agility skills that we just uh, developed over the last 15 weeks so that um, we can then build out the right staffing for our employees. Um, I think that we're going to have a lot of ability to transition, the ability to um, go in and out of uh, in-class instruction into remote instruction and back and forth, um, and however to articulate it in uh, perfect detail um, would be premature to be able to do because there really is just still a lot evolving as it relates to COVID-19. And the commitment to increase our communication to employees over the summer is a part of this roadmap of preparing for back to school. There'll be a lot of engagement opportunities, virtual town halls, virtual conversations in order to communicate what we know when and be able to be clear of things that we just don't know yet, even though we really wish we did. Um, and so exactly what every teacher's assignment looks like exactly on August 3rd is, is just we don't know that quite yet, but we know what the options could be. We know ex the, the framework that it's starting to take. And then when it comes to masks, uh, our Georgia Department of Education has articulated a masks optional model, and that's the one that this time we plan to follow. Uh, should conditions in Henry County change or the Georgia Department of Education make changes, then we will be prepared to make changes too, but that's where we are today. Um, I'm really grateful that our students have this summer learning recovery opportunity still throughout this strange time um, that we find ourselves, but I'm glad that we are still available to them some face-to-face -face, um, for that opportunity so that they can still have the same access to an education. Um, and I'm also really grateful for the opt-in choice for families. I've had several families reach out to me and say, can we drop them off today in, in order to start back on August 3rd? And several who have said, I just don't feel comfortable. So I'm really grateful that we are ensuring that all of our families and our students feel safe and secure um, as they return to school, whether that's virtually or in person. Um, also, thank you for mentioning, one of my questions was the K2 devices. So thank you for mentioning that um, there are plans in the works for that because I, I know that we need to ensure that our young students have access to virtual learning also if they don't have a device at home. Um, and the staffing models, I've also had teachers reach out to me and principals reach out and say, um, am I going to be in a classroom? Am I going to be at home? I, what am I supposed to do? So I'm, I know that y'all are hard at work with all of those moving parts. Um, and I'm really, really excited about the the K-5 expansion of our um, Impact Academy because with or without a pandemic, there are just some students and families who that works better for and that's a better learning environment. So I'm, I'm really excited that we can get that off the ground in the fall. Uh, Dr. Davis, could you uh, explain what curriculum, uh, curriculum the Impact Academy um, K through six grade levels will be using? Tonight, the board will take action on Impact Academy as a recommendation, um, and we have not publicly communicated the uh, K-5 plan uh, much more widely than this. However, um, uh, following the board's action tonight, we will dedicate staffing resources to come together, and now we'll spend the summer designing that K-5 program. Okay, my final question is, how will we support the students and teachers who have experienced trauma after these two major pandemics that we're, uh, that we're seeing that's going on now um, when they return back to the buildings? 
Yes, so um, first of all, our um, back to school task force uh, designed to focus on a safe, healthy, and inclusive environment for students and employees will be charged with building out our systematic approach to providing employees, resources, professional development, and training, as well as considering what will be the experiences of our uh, students as we come back together in, um, in those early days of August. We, we already have uh, tremendous counseling um, infrastructure in, in all of our schools, elementary, middle, and high. So the, the, we will lean on bringing counselor perspective into that work. Um, and also our psychologists and our social workers have tremendous strengths that have been deployed in more isolated ways that we now see as an opportunity to scale as a systematic way to ensure we assess the health, the wellness, and the readiness of each child, and we make uh, certain that we intervene and have a plan as we return together. I also do want to mention that um, we have an employee assistance program, the EAP, our EAP has been amazing for our, our actual, our employees, and it has been accessed uh, at, uh, at huge rates. And I'm so thankful for our HR division continuing to communicate that as an access point for our employees. And then when we pulled our leaders together last week um, in our leadership conference, we spent uh, most of that time of those two days talking about leading and preparing to lead with trauma-informed skills and just beginning to develop the responsibilities of our leaders to set up care teams at the local schools. How are we going to do that? And so we're, we've kind of started all of that, but I'll be able to prepare for the board a full and comprehensive presentation that includes every element of that uh, in, in, um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then lastly, we have had an amazing partnership with a telehealth uh, mental health uh, therapy um, specialist in the community. Um, it, it was in person, but they've expanded to tele-mental health for students that we already knew uh, to be uh, experiencing some mental, um, mental health uh, challenges and the benefit of continuing those services and being able to stay connected with um, kids who had been connected to a mental health professional um, is, was certainly a priority over the last couple weeks and as we head into the summer. So in addition to our board uh, being really excited about the school year starting back and whatever form that is, we're just excited to be able to bring, you know, a, a solid solution to meeting families where they are. Uh, however, the, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic plays out at, at this moment uh, across our state and, and we look uh, toward our trusted partners. To, to help us in making those decisions. But one of the things we have to have in order to keep our school system running is some funding. And so we, uh, one of the main processes, one of three main um, responsibilities of the board is setting a budget. And one of those processes has been delayed, unfortunately, due to the pandemic uh, and waiting on the state uh, legislature to you know set their budget for the year. We receive close to 60% or maybe a little bit more than 60% of our funding as a school system from the state. And without their budget being said, it's really tough to set ours uh, on the timeline that we wanted. But we had Chief uh, Financial Officer Christy Willis once again providing that update on where we are in that process. And right now, um, we're, we're looking, well, the board actually did take action uh, to approve an emergency spending resolution, which bridges that gap until we can fully enact our process to set our budget. But our budget, again, is dependent uh, largely on what the state provides to us. And so we are waiting for their return on June the 15th. They have until the end of the month to set their budget. And then we will be able to set a tentative budget, adopt a formal budget, and have our required budget hearings in the month of July to round out that process. Our board has done an incredible job to set us up uh, to be in a good financial uh, situation right now. Uh, their good stewardship, um, you know, over these past few years has really gotten us to a good point and including uh, this, uh, this latest good news with some of our bond debt, I believe. That's right, actually, J.D., uh, Ms. Willis also presented to the board uh, for informational purposes only that Henry County Schools is uh, going to formally retire some of the uh, bond debt 
And the reason that that has such significance is bond debt does not at all um, interact or uh, play a role in our general operating funds. But what bond debt does is declare the stability of your financial practices and your financial management. And being able to retire bond debt prior to its deadline shows strong, incredibly stable financial practices in an organization. And so the board actually commented on this since a large portion of their role is overseeing the financial practices of the organization. And I, I would love for you to take a listen. The early retirement of these bonds will have a net savings of $1,248,413 for the debt service fund. The leadership you continue to provide for prudent financial practices is further evidence of your commitment to our community, which allows for cost-saving cost decisions such as this. Thank you, Mrs. Willis, and I'll start just by saying thank you. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure the other board members will say something. Maybe you'll repeat that. But this is a huge deal. And I just want to thank you and your team for bring, just being aware of that possibility and you guys for uh, bringing financial uh, sound decisions to the board and my fellow board members for upholding and voting on those financial decisions because what this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is basically like everybody that owns a house. You have a mortgage, and if you pay it off early, you save on that nasty, nasty interest that nobody likes, correct? Correct. So this is, and we're saving over a million dollars? That, if I don't know, if, I, if I've ever heard of anything that says and screams financial stewardship of taxpayer dollars, that is it. But I want to, that starts with you and your team, and I just want to uh, say thank you for that. I just want to say congratulations. That is amazing. And of my 24 years of being on the board, that I think this is probably one of the very first times that I've heard that we've, we've paid it off early. I know we've paid off a lot of debt but not early, sometimes right there to the wire. But <laughs> this is awesome, and I appreciate your hard work and, um, and your team. You've got a phenomenal team, so thank you very much. This is so exciting, and that is one of my um, priorities as a board member is just the desire to be financially responsible. And so thank you so much to you and your team for helping carry that out because that is, is so huge, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Now I'll ask the question about bond debt. Could you explain what the retirement of bond debt means and how it affects our rating? Sure. Um, let's start with our rating. We currently have um, the highest rating that Standard & Poor's gives you is a AAA. We are a double A, so we are one step below that. The double A, the only difference is, and I have to look at the wording, you move from the obligation, um, the commitments of the obligation is very strong to extremely strong. So we are in that very strong category. And the retirement of the debt allows us to continue to shrink that debt margin to continue to be those good stewards of our um, community's commitment to allow us to have this bond debt. Since we're saving a million two hundred forty-eight thousand four hundred and thirteen dollars, does that money and Miss Willis go back into the general fund, or does it go into the the reserve? It actually is not part of the general fund. In the wonderful world of governmental accounting, this is a debt service fund. So if you'll think about it as a separate um, pot um, that it goes into, and it's for only the retirement of debt. So it can't be used because it is based on what our taxpayers have said that we are allowed to have debt for. I am um, just always blown away by by your reports and the fact that y'all um, ensure that we can be fiscally sound and responsible and good stewards of our taxpayer dollars. So thank you so much. Following our discussion regarding financial practices, financial management, and the financial picture for our future, uh, our Board of Education began discussing in a lot more detail the complexity of our digital infrastructure, 
the complexity of the teaching and learning practices, as well as the responsibility that fell on the shoulders of our leaders as we managed and led through our remote learning and are now transitioning into preparing for and anticipating a strong start to the school year. Um, really three presentations that together demonstrated just how well our organization was prepared for, led through, and is now uh, reflecting upon the work of remote learning. And maybe there was a lot of credit given to teachers and really the role that our teachers played as the distinguishing element for kids during remote learning. It, it, was, it was really an incredible discussion. Yeah, the, 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 the key players in all that, um, you know, as you mentioned, our students and our teachers um, really worked, uh, you know, a, as a part of this cross-divisional, this cross-functional work of our system. And when you talk about the three uh, components uh, uh, that are the three divisions that were responsible for the next uh, three portions of our, our board meeting agenda, you talk about really what the root of all of, you know, the, the efforts, you know, were put into it, you know, we've got, you know, technology, you've got the, the role that our leaders play, it, it can't be underscored enough. Uh, the, the valuable role, of course, we know that the principals in school communities are one of the most highly trusted individuals uh, and respected individuals in, in those in their respective areas, their respective communities. And when you couple that with, you know, the, the, the outstanding work of our teachers through our learning performance division, and then of course the key that held it all together, that really set Henry County Schools apart from, from a lot of people all across this nation who struggled during this time was our in, instructional technology and our, our you know, digital component, uh, which was only uh, possible through our one-to-one -one technology initiative. Without that, uh, I think Henry County Schools would have a, a little bit of a different story right now, but we're very thankful that we have the story that we have um, to be able to share with so many people about the success to wrap out or to wrap up the school year. And JD, we acknowledge that our K2 learners um, had gaps in accessing a device and uh, Dr. Brian Bland was already just able to talk about how we're preparing to remedy that should we need to rely on home access to a device for our K2 learners next year. We've also talked about securing additional hotspots um, so that students who had unstable broadband internet access, that would be able to be resolved in a proactive way. And really in the teaching and learning environment, getting a, a glimpse at how teachers turn their kitchens into classrooms and their living rooms into labs and, and really just got chills thinking about how teachers were able in 72 hours to take what they had been doing in person and been trained to do in person and really stand it up uh, in a remote environment in, in imperfect ways and not every student was able to do their best work and we want to do better um, to, fill those, uh, to fill those gaps. The technology was instrumental, and that was really a result of our taxpayers supporting East Floss program and ensuring that devices were in the hands of kids who learned here in Henry County. But it's our teachers who were capable of leveraging those devices and keeping connection points going for kids. Um, and so really the reflection was strong. Our Board of Education has been proud of our professionals and, and really spent a good bit of time talking about that. Thank you so much for that very thorough report. And I just want to say um, I appreciate that you've highlighted the hard work that our teachers have been doing. And I love the video. That was just precious and so heartwarming to see um, because they have just poured their hearts and souls into ensuring that our students could continue learning. And I really, as I was sitting listening to you talk about all of this hard work, I'm really hopeful that our leaders at the state level will also uh, take note of what our teachers have done and the hard work they put into this and keep that in mind when they're setting their budgets and keep the priority on our teachers and um, continue funding their salaries. Uh, that's very important to me and I hope that they will take note of that also. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I too just wanna thank our teachers. The work that they were able to pull off was truly miraculous, as you said. Um, and I know they would have given anything, any day to be back face-to-face um, -face with their students, but that did not stop them from 
engaging with the students and ensuring that they were still learning at very high levels. Um, I know that we have room to grow, though, with that being said, so I'm grateful that y'all are looking so in-depth into our areas where we need growth, and I know that that will continue as we move into this new school year. Um, and I'm just grateful that we're still talking about accountability. It's an uncomfortable word to talk about, especially during this time, but we are still held accountable for students' learning. Um, so I'm grateful that we are looking at other metrics to ensure that that's, that's happening. So our Board of Education resumed the business of the board to evaluate our policies. They were able to review another set of policy proposals that are now out on our district website for your review and your comments. And then the board took action on the set of policies that have been out for public review since our May board meeting. Uh, really coupled with that was action taken on a new policy for policy JCAC, our sexual harassment policy, which is now in alignment with recently released federal regulations in time to start our new school year. And then really as part of that policy work and as an extension of that was the adoption of 2020-2021 code of conduct and that really is uh, positioning the organization to have its infrastructure intact as we prepare to start uh, a new school year. So that leaves only a couple more items that uh, our board took action on that we'd like to cover with you uh, here on our uh, board meeting recap. One of those is a, a, a brand new uh, expansion of one of our outstanding programs here in Henry County Schools. Now, many people may be familiar with the virtual academy known as Impact Academy. Uh, since its inception uh, over over five plus years ago, uh, which gave students another choice in Henry County Schools to you know learn. We recognize that uh, students learn in many different ways, and we understand that uh, virtually is something that works best for some of our students. And so Impact Academy has been wildly successful since its inception, and it started with a small number of students, just over 100, and has expanded uh, to include students um, that make that choice, and there's actually a waiting list for it right now, but students through six, uh, from sixth through 12th grade. Um, we are looking now to add K through five to be able, and students in kindergarten through fifth grade to be able to uh, choose the virtual academy uh, as their preferred choice of schooling uh, if, if that's what they and their family feel is best for them. Of course, uh, Steve Thompson, who's the administrator at that school, will be uh, kind of spearheading this effort along with a lot of work uh, put in by our learning performance division and other divisions uh, across the system to make sure that this goes off uh, without a hitch and is, is you know, as successful for our young students as it has been for our older, our middle school and our high school students. So we look forward to bringing you uh, more information about that as we uh, get deeper into that uh, process uh, for uh, introducing it into our school system. Now, the, uh, one other thing that we had is kind of a procedural item. Uh, we have a, a workers' compensation board of physicians that uh, Miss Valerie Sue Smith, our chief human resources officer, was able to provide. Uh, it is a requirement each year that we uh, have the board's approval on that list, so they approve that unanimously along with, uh, you know, approving unanimously the consent agenda and, you know, which also included our Impact Academy expansion. So, a lot of good stuff that we were able to uh, cover there. Uh, another uh, thing that we were able to uh, recognize during our board meeting that we, uh, we've sorely missed uh, is the ability to have students in person in our meetings, but we've been able to draw inspiration and hope from our Art of Hope uh, exhibition that uh, currently sits on our website. And this month, we actually pulled our inspiration from a uh, young ensemble of students from Luella Elementary that performed The Lion King virtually. So they were able to share one of the songs um, from The Lion King, and uh, we, can, we can hear a little bit of that right now. So enemies beware. I've never seen a king of beasts with quite so little hair. I'm gonna be the main event like no king was before. I'm brushing up, I'm looking down, I'm working on my roar. The sparkle thunder, uninspiring. <laughs> oh, I just can't wait to be king. No, no say you do this. No, 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 no,
those students were incredible and really, again, uh, set the right tone um, for, for our meetings like all of our students uh, do with their, uh, their inspiring acts and talents. From there, we were able to uh, welcome uh, a few new administrative team members uh, to schools across our district. I know that's a favorite of yours, uh, Superintendent Davis. So uh, who do we get to welcome this month? Yes, it was my pleasure and always my favorite part of the meeting. Um, I've actually gotten us a little bit behind on appropriately recognizing and welcoming to our leadership team. So this is actually old news now, but Mr. Michael Teddy is a new assistant principal for Timber Ridge Elementary School. And so welcome officially to the team, even though I actually know you've been hard at work. And I also want to welcome uh, Luciana Walden, our new uh, assistant principal at uh, Oakland Elementary School, and Aisha Thompson, our new assistant principal at Tassahaw Elementary School. So welcome to the team. Congratulations. And as always, we can't wait to see your immediate impact. Yes, most definitely. Uh, we, we highly value each and every one of the employees and the roles they play in our school system and helping the experience for our students and their families and our community to be the best that they can be. Uh, we recognize that that is incumbent upon everybody and uh, with everybody's support, their unified support, we're able to uh, accomplish that and make sure that our students leave here uh, with the best experiences possible to uh, you know to enter that next stage of their life. We are so fortunate again to have you join us for another board meeting recap this time for June. This is the last official month uh, in the school calendar year. The next time we come to you, we will be in the 2020 2021 school year and, uh, and we'll be sharing uh, once again all the great actions and news from our Board of Education. As always, thanks for joining us. I'm your host, J.D. Harden, co-host Mary Elizabeth Davis. We hope to see you next month. As is the case with most board meetings, there's a lot more information that you're able to witness being there in person or watching the full version on demand that we're unable to bring to you here in this very short board meeting recap. The links to those presentations and videos can be found in the description section directly below this video.